This is the Chedi Jagan International Airport at Tamari. The airport is located 41 kilometers, roughly 25 miles, outside of the city it serves, Georgetown. Between the airport and Georgetown sits the East Bank Corridor, the busiest and most densely populated area anywhere in Ghana. The road that connects Georgetown to Tamari has a stated speed limit of 50 km per hour, and yet commuting between the two can take the better part of two hours. To understand why such a short drive takes so long, to understand why traffic crawls along the East Bank Corridor, we need to understand how transportation works in Ghana. This map shows Ghana's public transportation network. The only regularly scheduled public transportation services in Ghana are those ferries connecting communities west of the Esquibo River to the rest of the country. Outside of the ferry services, privately owned minibuses are the closest option to public transportation. Including minibuses extends the public transportation network from this to this. And while this might suggest that public transportation is an option, the reality is that public transportation is only used by those who can't afford the alternative, personal, private transportation. But this wasn't always the case. In 1948, the Demerara Burbis Railway commenced operations as the first railway not in Guyana, but anywhere on the South American continent. While the line was planned for transporting sugar, public routes were also serviced. The line initially operated between Georgetown and Plaisance, with extensions to Belfield in 1854 and Mahaika in 1864. By 1899, the Demerara Burbis Railway extended from Georgetown to Rosignol, and at its peak called it 17 stations, including Georgetown, Plaisance, Buxton, Nonpearl, Golden Grove, Clonebrook, Mahaika, Maikoni, Lynchfield, Fort Wellington, and Rosignol. Meanwhile, a second line was being built across the Demerara River from Georgetown. By 1914, the line extended from Breedenhoek to Parika and called at 10 stations along the way. Had the Demerara Burbis and Demerara Esquibo railways continued operations, they would today be accessible by over 460,000 people, or roughly one and a half times Ghana's population at the network's peak in the 1920s. But it was not to be. By 1974, all passenger rail service in Ghana was discontinued. Unprofitability was one of the main reasons cited, and bus services replaced trains. When the buses that replaced the trains fell into disrepair, or were inoperable, or eventually exceeded their lifespan, they were replaced instead with private buses, and eventually with today's minibuses. While privately owned, these minibuses operate along designated routes. While minibuses provide an important service to citizens, they are often a reason for pause. Headlines such as these are not uncommon. Coupled with what many Guyanese agree is reckless driving and a reckless disregard for passenger safety, it's easy to see why public transportation is only taken out of necessity. So how does this impact traffic today? After the removal of public rail service in 1974, Successive administrations have focused on private cars as a means of mobility around the country. Therefore, billions of dollars have been poured not into infrastructure, but into car-centric infrastructure. As Ghana's economy grew, land, home, and car ownership became indicators of success. To meet demand for housing, land was allocated for housing developments further and further outside of Georgetown. As people moved out of the city, Jobs did not. This necessitated commuting to the city, and with non-existent public transportation, incentivized private car ownership. For decades, these developments were concentrated along the East Bank Corridor in areas such as Maka, Providence, and Greater Diamond. As suburban population grew, so too did car ownership. Between 1933 and 1970, Ghana registered almost 26,000 private motor vehicles, or 700 per year. In just the eight months between October 2020 and May 2021, that number stood at 8,000. 
Unlike developed Western markets, where car ownership is mostly saturated, in Guyana, the market is still in the early stages of growth and is increasing almost exponentially. As car ownership grows, so too does demand for car infrastructure. This mirrors a trend seen before. In the 1920s, the price of cars was finally low enough for car ownership to be attainable for the average American household. By the end of World War II, with thousands of veterans returning from Europe, the population of American suburbs exploded. With cars being affordable and public transportation in decline, car ownership nationwide also increased significantly. This is Boston, Massachusetts in 1938. Being a well-established city before cars were common, Boston was built around public transit and streets were narrow. As the number of cars in the city and suburbs grew, Boston invested in highways and expanding roads to accommodate its shiny new automobiles. This is Boston in 2014. Boston, like many other American cities, bulldozed large swaths of houses and businesses to make room for cars. Atlanta, Baltimore, and Philadelphia show similar changes. What these four cities, Boston, Philly, Baltimore, and Atlanta, also have in common is that in 2019, they all ranked in the top 10 most congested cities in the country. Drivers in these four cities spent an average of 114 hours, almost five full days, sitting in traffic. These cities represent the norm, not the exception. Through the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, American cities gained access to almost unlimited funding for expanding roads and building new highways. Overwhelmingly, American cities carved out room, often by displacing poor and minority neighborhoods, to make space for cars. The interstate highway system undoubtedly contributed massively to the development of the United States. Despite the steep initial price tag, despite contributing further to racial segregation, despite costly maintenance and expansion, the interstate system is viewed as a net positive. For every dollar spent, it returned six dollars in economic development. However, the role the interstate played in increasing car dependence and congesting American cities cannot be overstated. This is the KT Freeway the world's widest highway. At peak hours, even this 26-lane wide highway has backed up traffic. There is no clear singular cause to traffic congestion worldwide. What is clear, however, is this. In case after case, study after study, regardless of where, one finding always holds true. Widening existing roads and building new highways are neither sustainable nor are they effective solutions to traffic congestion. On the contrary, widening roads actually makes traffic worse in the long run. Investment in car-centric infrastructure incentivizes car ownership and further induces demand for more car-centric infrastructure. But induced demand works in reverse. Disincentivizing car ownership while investing in good public transportation induces demand for even more proper public transportation infrastructure. At Mahaika and Maikoni, you can still see these. Bridges that once carried South America's first railway line now serve only as monuments to a bygone era. Their abandonment is a stark reminder of the non-existence of public transportation infrastructure in Guyana. When the first roads along the East Bank Corridor became too congested, government poured money into widening the stretch of road from Georgetown to Providence from two lanes to four. Because it worked so well the first time, when the road between Providence and Diamond became too congested, government doubled down, investing again in widening the road from two lanes to four. Works have started to widen the remainder of the East Bank Corridor to four lanes, and a new bypass road is planned from Eccles to Diamond. To dream of this, a detached single-family house in the suburbs, a quiet life outside of the city, is also to dream of the hours spent commuting and billions of dollars worth of productivity lost due to traffic. 
With the doubling down on short-sighted projects, continued spending on the expansion of existing car-centric infrastructure, and a continued disregard for public transportation, the future of Guyana, at least along the East Bank Corridor, is almost certainly car dependence and even worse traffic.